He was a hairdresser during the day and he played in an experimental rock band at night. This iconic 80s lead singer reveals how he created the shimmering new wave wall of sound that he dubbed Punk Floyd. Uh, with his plucky exploration, he created a song that in the years since has become an emotional guitar-driven hit that even now sounds 50 years ahead of its time. Coming up next, the story of this immaculate 80s record. It's coming up on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if a song has ever come over the sound system or your radio or in the car and it's turned you into a madman, you know, trying to figure out who sings this song, you're gonna dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now and do click the bell so that you always know when our videos drop. Also, you can become a VIP on Patreon below that helps us keep it a daily channel. So it's time for another edition of our series, Number One in Our Hearts, where we break down a song that is so exceptional, so immaculate, it deserved to be at the top of the charts, but for whatever reason, it came up short. So we give it the number one spot in our own way for one day. So let's jump in the DeLorean again and set the circuits for February 12th, 1983, where New York City has its fourth largest snowfall in the state's history, 18 inches. Sports Wayne Gretzky wins the MVP in the NHL All-Star Game by setting a record scoring four goals in one period. And he continues to set records again. Look at that one. Dr. J won the MVP of the NBA All-Star Game where Marvin Gaye performed a soulful rendition of the national anthem. If you were to flip on the TV, you could watch the miniseries The Winds of War. You can also watch Cheers or Cagney and Lacey. And many are getting ready for the series finale of MASH that would be broadcasted just a few weeks later to a record 125 million people. If you trudge down to the cinema, you can catch The Dark Crystal or 48 Hours, or Tootsie, or even The Verdict. In a place outside time. And a music down under by Man at Work is at number one with the duet between Patty Austin and James Ingram, Baby Come to Me, and uh, Marvin Gaye's sexual healing nipping at their heels. But down the charts a ways uh, was a magnetic song that deserved to be enshrined at the top of the charts. It was a breathtaking slice of sonic perfection. And it peaked at number 30. A Flock of Seagulls classic new love song and follow-up to their hit single, I Ran. The 80s masterpiece, Space Age Love Song. Space Age Love Song, it still pops up in our culture from movies to video games. It was just used in Spider-Man Homecoming a few years back. It's a song that seriously, it sounds 50 years ahead of its time even now. It paints such a sonic picture that few songs have. Is it just me? Let me know in the comments what you think. I, it just makes the hair on my neck stand up every time. With the story of this lush new wave wall of sound song, here is the story from a Flock of Seagulls iconic frontman Mike Score. This is a cool one. As we go into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses I always wear. Treat yourself today. Go design your own pair or several pairs for that matter. Add some soul and style to your life at the link below zenny.com. Here's Mike Score with the story. I joined a band first. Um, played with them for a little while. And then I got thrown out of that band basically and decided that you can't throw me out of my own band. So I started my own band. Oh yeah. And then my brother became involved and Frank who worked with me became involved. And we tried five, six, seven, eight, nine guitar players. And they used to come up to our rehearsal and just stand there and listen to us and go, why do you guys need a guitar player? You sound great just as you are. And then eventually Paul came along and you know, we talked to him about what we could hear in our heads for music. And he was the first one that went, okay, I'll do that. And he just did yeah. it. And all of a sudden, 
it was our sound. It really wasn't a synth band as much as it was, it was guitar with it. So the power chords and... It oh. was somewhere between Pink Floyd and Punk Floyd, I think. It really was. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You guys practiced above your salon. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, we had a great room. It was like a Victorian, um, a forgotten room. It, yeah. uh, above my salon was a little stairway about, I don't know, 15, 18 inches wide. And we used to climb up there with all our gear. We <laughs> set it all up and we turned it at full crank, you know. So, and we're like, nobody can hear us. Of course, everybody could hear us <laughs> out in the street. <laughs> And we would rehearse from, say, eight, eight at night till four in the morning and then wow. fall asleep in, in the salon and go to work the next day. Wow. So it was, a, it was a brilliant, you know, our own little universe of music and hairdressing. So Well, and the name came from Toiler on the Sea, right? The Strangler song. That was always kind of the rumor. Yeah. Uh, before that, we, you know, we were looking for a name and uh, I read a book called Level 7. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a really dark uh, technological book disaster book basically so i wanted to call the band level seven so we put level seven on our chalkboard just after we did that level 42 came out so oh, we're like oh yeah we were like damn it we had a really good name and then uh we got the black and white album by the stranglers and toiler on the sea was on it and um you know it was my favorite band and we went to see them live do it and hugh cornwell um whether he did or not i swear it <laughs> he pointed at me in the middle of the song, went, a flock of seagulls. And I was really? like, that's it. We are a flock of seagulls. Wow. So we went uh, back to our rehearsal after seeing the Stranglers, rubbed out level seven and wrote a flock of seagulls. And, and then other things started to point towards, you know, oh, it seems to fit with the whole seagulls thing, you know? 82, when the self-titled album came out, your debut album, you guys got a great review from Robert Chris Gow, who's one of the toughest critics out there. And then winning a Grammy for an instrumental, DNA, which is really cool. But do you remember the first time that you guys heard yourselves on the radio? Or do you remember where you were, where it kind of finally resonated with you? Like, hey, this is going somewhere. Um, the first time we were ever on the radio was actually in Liverpool. We were rehearsing and we'd just, you know, done a cassette. And just over the road to where we rehearsed was a big Liverpool station. And they were doing demo night. They're like, send bands, send your demos in. So we were like, hey, let's take this cassette in and we'll see, you know, because about half an hour before demo night started. So we took it in, we left it at the desk, and then we ran back to our rehearsals and tuned the radio in to see what we could get. <laughs> and lo and behold, it came on. So yeah. whoever had just gone to the desk and picked up the demos, maybe it was the only one for the night. <laughs> and they just went, oh, here's a demo. We put it on. And it was Iran. And yeah. it just sounded to us just totally spectacular. I never thought I'd meet a girl like you. And we were like, I think we're going to make it. <laughs> I think it's going <laughs> to happen, you know. And, wow. uh, and of course, radio does something to the sound. You know, they squash it across oh, it. Oh, yeah. And it just really sounded good. So that made us... Uh, potential rock stars just hearing that yeah the other great time was we uh first time we flew into la mm -hmm. i think we just landed and we were you know being limoed around a little right, bit right and uh it came on the radio wow. iran came on the radio and we were just like wow it, it sounded great in liverpool but because the way american radio does it it was like, it sounds as good as what was before and as good as what was after. So, but, you know, by then we already had a deal and our album was made and it was a, a year and a half after the Liverpool one. So, uh, and we, we were just like beaming. And of course we were getting more and more into being sci-fi sound and we thought our sound was, was really sci-fi. So the lyrics and stuff had to be sci-fi, but then it was also, but most hit songs or love songs. So they became sci-fi love songs. Yeah. <laughs> so we wanted to be really heavy and really growling synths because we listen to synths and they're all like so pretty. And, yeah. you know, and I'm like, I don't want to be like pretty, pretty. Yeah. I want the synths to growl with the bass and, and stuff like that. At that time, we couldn't really play, so we're trying to cover up with big sounds. If you can't put intricate stuff in, then you just make it big. Uh, big synth sounds, big pads, 
big guitar sounds. That the lead, you know, a big synth pad that the lead guitar can play across and the melody will kind of join in with it. That was something that we knew we were doing, but we never really thought of it as a wall of sound. Right. You know, it, to us, that was just how we sounded. I did a gig in Orlando about five or six years ago, and a friend of mine who'd never seen us came to the show, and he said, your sound is just a shimmering wall. And I was like, wow. And he goes, it sounds fantastic, not like any other band. But to me, it's always like, this is just how we sound. Well, but if I Phil Spector says it's a wall of sound, it's a wall it's of sound. It's a wall of sound, <laughs> no, no question. Yeah. Well, Space Age Love Song is, uh, it was always my favorite song. And that was cool about MTV, you'd see it. You didn't have the internet to go jump on and say, oh, I'm gonna listen to it again. You wait for it to come back on the radio or mm. back on MTV and you go buy the record because you just wanted to dig into it. And Space Age Love Song, I think I listened to the album before it came out as a single. Right. But that's what's interesting about you guys' songs. There's so many melodies going on. We talk about a wall of sound, but it's almost like you could create three or four songs from each song that you guys did. Tell me about how that one came together. I got home from rehearsal one mm -hmm. night and I was still, you know, hyper from rehearsing yeah. and excited. I had a little four track um, cassette recorder. I had a little Casio, I think it was, keyboard. And I just went, okay, I'm just gonna mess around. And I, I played the chords and I was like, wow, that was really cool. What did I play? <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I kind of worked it out again, recorded it, put a little, uh, you know, boom, with vocal drum beat on it because I didn't have drum machines or anything. My brother at that time lived next door to me. You know, I'd set, we had, I had an apartment here, I had one there. So I think it was probably eight o'clock in the morning, I was still awake messing with this song. And I went to him and I said, hey, listen to this, I just wrote it. <laughs> and he just went, it's rubbish. <laughs> so, uh, so we got to rehearsal that, that night and I went, here's that little song I wrote last night, you know, so everyone's like, okay, let's, let's play it. And of course, now we had the big synth sound, real drums, Simmons drums, proper electronic drums. And I had some of the lyrics, which were inspired by just meeting someone and catching their eye, you know. I wanted it to be simple and totally understandable so that everybody yeah. knew. You know, everybody knows when you meet a girl and you look in her eyes, if there's a spark, there's yeah. a spark. Right. You know, and if there's not, then down the road you go. Um, but I did actually write other lyrics for it when I was writing it at home. It's just that when we got to rehearsal, I put the nicer lyrics in. And I, I just wanted it to be simple. And then we were saying to Paul, you know, we have to find a, a counterpart, a simple guitar melody to go with that. Because we were all like, this is a pop song. It's a little space age uh, pop song. And we, we actually were looking for a name for it. And Frank said, it just sounds like a space age love song. So we wrote space age love song on our blackboard and we never rubbed it off because we would say, let's, let's rehearse Space Age. And over time, that little guitar melody that we were kind of singing developed into this because it's like once you get into a song and you're, you're confident in the part, yeah. you start expanding it and developing it and hey, give it a bit more of this kind of sound and that. Don't get in the way of me singing and space drums came out, you know. Uh -huh. doo -doo -doo -doo. So we went out, bought one of those, and immediately it fitted that song, you know, perfectly. So we had that song uh, probably over about a week of playing, I think that song nonstop turned into people's favorite and, you know, one of my favorites that we ever wrote to. I love how you don't really hear the big guitar melody until really two minutes into the song, the da na na yeah. and then the high part of that, the melody. Yeah, where it really da, goes up. Da. But we would just, once you, once you get a song and you rehearse it and you start thinking, once you know it, you have more room to, to escalate it. 
And we were like, wouldn't that be awesome if it just soared up like this, you know? It's like, well, let's move everything up an octave, you know? Keep the drums and bass low so the keyboards and guitar go up. And all of a sudden, again, you get this like rush and almost like a cold rush through you and you go, well, wow, what did we just do, yeah. you know? It defined our sound again, you know? What I love about you guys' music, I was just talking to Dell about this, is that your songs didn't sound the same. A lot of people would have a hit and then they would try to follow it up with part two of that hit. And for me, it, you knew it was you guys, but the songs all sound different from each other. You know what they are. Hmm. But also, no pun intended, but there's a lot of space, not just space, but space right. in your songs. The vocal and you hear the different melodies because there's enough space in there that you can enjoy the song and really hear those parts. Yeah, I think that comes again from not being able to play that well. <laughs> so we weren't filling up the spaces with yeah. fancy, fancy bits, you know. Yeah. We were just concentrating on the atmosphere of what we were doing. And then, you know, maybe going, oh, how about a little bit of lead there, you know, yeah. or I'll do some vocals there or something, you know, not, not too fancy drums or anything. It was more about the songs than the players, where some bands are all like the drummer will go, rah, da, 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 you right. Know? And to us, that was like, that just gets in the way of everything. It's killing the atmosphere. And as far as the songs being different, I think we got that from listening to the Beatles. Whereas, you know, Liverpool, the whole scene was the yeah. Beatles. And everything the Beatles do is more or less different. They can write something that sounds 40s and then do Helter Skelter. And I think that influenced the writing too. Will you still feed me? Well, it's As, interesting how you guys' writing also influenced other people because the Flaming Lips covered that song. I mean, Laszlo Bain. And, I mean, this is How dare they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the hairstyle. This one. One of the greatest <laughs> hairstyles. It was read that you had uh, tried to comb your hair like Ziggy, right? Ziggy Stardust. We were backstage. Uh, Frank and I, it was the original, Frank was the original bass player. We both had Ziggy's sticking up about three yep. inches. So we were in the dressing room trying to make our hair even bigger, you know? So I'm like in the mirror giving it the old hair dryer and spraying it and stuff like this. And Frank comes up behind me, puts his hand on top of my head <laughs> and just basically said, move down a bit so I can see myself, you know? And it just completely flattened the top and it all just fell forward like this, but the sides stayed up. And our manager at the time was like, come on, stop messing around. You've got to go on stage. So it was like, oh, geez, you know. So walked on stage and I noticed people pointing at it and uh, came off stage, did the show. And everyone was like, wow, your hair looks amazing. What did you do? And then, you know, it was just like, wow. Happy it? accident. Yeah. Wow. And then my manager goes, do that again. I think you've got something. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, from that again, it just developed into, you know, okay, I'm going to now comb it up and well, get bigger and You definitely had something because Yeah, it's friends. an icon now. It's it like is. completely without me, but you know. <laughs> it's the wedding singer. Hey, do you like Flock of Seagulls? I can see you do. Wish me luck. And then Pulp Fiction. I mean, mm -hmm. that was probably a, a pinch me moment. Like, that's pretty cool. And hit the spot. You. Flock of seagulls. You know why we're here? Well, it just shows that you do something stupid and you've known forever. <laughs> <laughs> no. But it was, uh, it also fitted in the whole sound and our image. And people suddenly went, wow. You know, I mean, it's kind of like David Bowie did with Ziggy. He had a whole image with his hair. And that's the way it went. Yeah. The hair looked right for the bands, looked right for the sound. You know, people started copying it, yeah, talking yeah. about oh, it. Oh, yeah. You know, so uh, a happy, the happiest of all accidents. That last video was Mike Score and the band collaborating with the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. You can see the performance uh, from our link below. Here's another great part. Such an incredible song. Leave us a comment about this transcendent hit. Uh, what are your memories of it? Stories from your life. Share them below. 
uh, I just think it's one of the greatest songs of the 80s. Make sure to, to subscribe below if you like this to get our daily features and check us out on Patreon to help our mission continue forward. Your support is paramount. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords.